All right, let's get to international affairs. There's a lot of stuff going on there is. Uh, that was covered up by the Trump indictment. The first and foremost is a massive story about the petrodollar and about the way that other nations outside of the West are handling relations with China, with Russia, with vis-a-vis the United States and Ukraine. There was a very interesting and noticed clip from Fox News where Senator Marco Rubio actually went on Fox to decry Brazil ditching the petrodollar for future oil transactions with China and talking about the declining efficacy of U.S. sanctions. Let's take a listen to that. Today, Brazil, in our hemisphere, largest country in the Western Hemisphere south of us, cut a trade deal with China. They're going to, from now on, do trade in their own currencies, get right around the dollar. They're creating a a secondary economy in the world, totally independent of the United States. We won't have to talk about sanctions in five years because there'll be so many countries transacting in currencies other than the dollar. That, that we won't have the ability to sanction them. As, as we are sitting here, you know, focused on some of these nuttiness that's going on, you know, people that are basically dedicating their lives in this country to ensuring that it is legal to mutilate children, to do drag shows in schools, they, they dedicate their lives to this, and we have a, 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 another superpower that basically wants to become the world's dominant power at our expense, and these people don't want to focus on it. So very interesting, at least the front part of, of uh, that get criticism. Gotta war uh, to get there. In there. Yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of funny to see the two pair together. But look, he's actually not wrong. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. China and Russia are currently looking to challenge the petrodollar. It's a very interesting write-up over from oil price. What they point to right now is that currently the yuan accounts for just 2.7% of the global oil market. However, a lot of the more recent deals in recent weeks are signaling that the Chinese and the Russians are moving to try and sideline the Dollar, not only from Brazil, as he said, which is the largest uh, nation in all of South America, but actually during that visit to Riyadh, Xi Jinping in December said that the China and the Arab Gulf states are going to be trying to use Shanghai Petroleum and Natural Gas Exchange platforms to carry out Yan's settlement on oil and gas trades. So a separate infrastructure is propping up through which the petro uh, to replace the petrodollar specifically to try and circumvent U.S. sanctions. Right now. of global currency reserves are the U.S. dollar from 2022. Only 2.7% of that, uh, like I said, remains in the Chinese yuan. But, I mean, even a 10% increase in that is a massive sea change to the global reserve currency. But drop even uh, the global reserve currency and all of that rhetoric. Why does it matter? Because, let's put this up there, and this is straight from Chinese media, from the South China Morning Post. I thought it was important to actually pull the perspective that they are trying to push out there, which is that the Brazilian inroads and de-dollarization is, quote, reflecting cracks in U.S. currency settlements. Here's really what happened, and this is why I was a huge critic also of what was going on um, in the initial days of sanctioning. We basically blew up the global financial trade system for a country, Russia, and for another country, Ukraine, which at the end of the day, the material fate of those two countries, especially Ukraine, has zero impact on the U.S. economy and on the U.S. way of life. I know there's going to have a lot of Ukrainian NAFO stands in the comments, but here's the deal. Whoever controls Kyiv, that doesn't affect anybody's life in Nebraska. However, there are a lot of other countries and potential conflicts where that is not the case. And so one of the things that I was trying to say then is you only get one shot at this, at showing your hand. You know, whenever you're the empire and you, uh, you, you know, like pull the ripcord on your real, like most financial power that you have, you better do it on something that really matters. We decided to do that on Ukraine. Well, the Chinese, the second second largest economy on earth, far more powerful ever than the USSR, they saw all of that in Beijing and they're like, okay, that's just never going to ever happen to us. And they're not fools. So what do they do? Immediately, they started doing wand deals with um, Russia. They go to India as well. India then, one of the largest nations outside of China, says, well, we still want cheap oil. And so they decide to start pricing things in different currency when buying from the Russians, the Brazilians who are not on board with us at all. And uh, how many times, Crystal, have we pointed to global public opinion that says that the rest of the world does not agree with us on Ukraine? They don't agree with Russia either, but they definitely don't agree with the NATO-centric view of the conflict that this is some existential threat to their interests. They don't really care either way. They're like, yeah, I'm not saying it's good, but, you know, like cheap oil is nice because that's what we have to, uh, at the end of the day, we got to care for our own citizens. So looking at this and just seeing the colossal economic blunder that we have made, we essentially sacrificed really, I think, the only chance we ever had at at being able to like financially push back on China if we ever wanted to. 
um, in exchange for, you know, the fate of Eastern Donbass in Ukraine, which I think is nuts. I mean, there's no balance sheet where any of this makes sense. We really yeah. warned about this yes. early on, that there's yeah. a cost to, it's not just a cost yeah. to, you know, Russian society for the economic warfare right. that we were waging, but that there were real risks entailed here. But I think you have to go back even before that. I mean, we have tried to throw our weight around with sanctions far too many times. Mm, yeah. And even including with regard to Russia before this particular uh, war and illegal invasion, because they had years after our initial sort of round of sanctions to build up barriers right, to insulate themselves, yeah. right, past 2013, to insulate themselves from the economic warfare that we wage. So I'm not going to say that it has had no impact, but certainly hasn't had the impact that we thought here in the, the West that it was going to have. And this is reminder with a more or less unified West with regard to China, the views are far less unified mm -hmm. among, you know, the, our European allies and us. So we sort of showed our hand here and showed some weakness yeah. because China's looking at this and going, hey, if Russia can be basically OK, we can build up some other relationships here that we already have been working on. And then we're not so worried about these sanctions either. Now, on the other hand, of course, it is a much deeper trading relationship with the Chinese, which both entails a lot more risk for us and also a lot more risk for them. But we gave them the roadmap. Mm -hmm. We blew our whole wad, so to speak, <laughs> and allowed them to see exactly how far we could go. And then they can use that as their own roadmap to make sure they can insulate themselves from any future economic warfare to come. So listen, I mean, in a sense, number one, you can't blame them. Number two, we really kind of asked for it. And we, from the beginning, have been warning about the potential domestic consequences here and consequences for our standing in the world of using these, of weaponizing these sanctions over and over again. Yeah, and I just can't get over how f big of fools that we look like on the global stage. Zoom out of NATO, where apparently we're like the greatest heroes, although in private they're happy to take your money and then stab you in the back whenever they want to. We'll get to that. But look at Saudi Arabia, a country that we spend $100 billion a year in sending weapons to. We underwrite their security. This family would never be in charge if it wasn't for a U.S. global underwriting. They're willing to literally take your money and then look at you and put the middle finger right in your face. Put this up there on the screen. Right now, the decision to go ahead and cut oil, to raise oil prices, was very simple. This is David Ignatius, by the way, who's writing this. The United States doesn't call the shots in the Persian Gulf or the oil market anymore. For better or worse, the era of American hegemony in the Middle East is over. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman pressed oil OPEC producers. This is the key. MBS specifically went to OPEC and said, we want to cut to buy 1 million barrels per day to boost the price of crude from 85 to $85 a barrel up by 6%. Why? To make more money and to make it more difficult for the US economy and for the West during the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Now a real ally would do what? The a, they would either do what you would tell them to do if it's a, a client state, or B, Somebody who you know wants friendly relations and thinks that this is like a give and take relationship would say, "All right, we'll hear you out, and we'll take the temporary hit. You know, it's not like we aren't hundred billionaires several times over, and we'll make sure that oil is cheaper." They don't care. They literally don't. They disregard what Washington has said. They have stabbed us now in the eye four or five times whenever it comes to OPEC production. And the only fools are us. In Congress, they're still selling them weapons. The Biden administration goes over there and bows down before MBS like a joke, you know, in front of the entire world. They're laughing because they got the president of the United States to come over there, whatever, you know, he didn't shake his hand. He just gave him a fist bump. Uh -oh. Like, wow, you really showed it to him there, uh, Mr. President. And then the moment you leave, they have China over. They strike this deal with Iran and allow Beijing to be the broker. And if you think Beijing doesn't have its hand behind this decision, either and then you're a fool. I mean, yeah. it's like in every single theater all across the world, in Asia, in South Korea and Japan, they're doubting whether we're actually going to be doing it. You know, the Taiwanese president uh, is transiting through America. I always love how we do these fake diplomatic things. She was in California and she met with uh, House, uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Same thing. You know, the Taiwanese, we're actually been shorting them on arms so that we can send them to Ukraine. I've been looking also and tracking people who are inside DOD are warning about the level of shortages that we have. We are incurring massive 
uh, hurts across the world and here at home on behalf of this Ukrainian conflict. And I don't know how you can possibly look you know, at this from a 30,000 foot level and say that any of this is worth it vis-a-vis -vis to what we're actually doing. The Russian invasion, and we're gonna get to this yeah. in just a moment, in a lot of ways has been just a total disaster for Russia. Of course. But really yeah. sort of forced um, into reality uh, a multipolar world. And maybe it revealed what already existed because the relationships that China has been building around the world, I mean, this goes back years at this point. Um, I was uh, listening this morning to a podcast about their, you know, more specifics about their efforts in Africa, where it's a double-edged sword. You know, they um, load up these countries with a lot of debt, but there are very visible signs of Chinese influence, a road, a dam, a bridge, an airport, sometimes with the Chinese flag flying outside, that in some places people are very grateful for this level of development, whereas the U.S. has basically treated Africa as like another front of their war on terror. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a double-edged sword because then at the end of the day, you've got a, a nation that's loaded up with debt, but you can see in the seeds that um, the Chinese government has been planting for years and years, you know, when the U.S. goes to the world and says, hey, we need you on our side in terms of the Ukraine war, most of the world's like, I think we're going to stay out of this right. one, actually, right. you know, whether it's the African nations, whether it's nations in South America, whether it's India. They're like, you know, we're going to let you work this one out and we're going to kind of stay on the sidelines and see how it all unfolds. Yeah, they're, I mean, look, New Delhi is happy to take cheap gas as long as they can get it. Brazil will do the same thing and so will a lot of developing countries. Even the South Koreans are out there selling arms to anybody who's got money because they're like, oh, American arms are going to Ukraine. We'll take those dollars and we'll make sure that uh, we can stand it up. I was looking at it from a macro view and I was just thinking about it this way. O only the US is the nation which is not allowed by its elite and its presidents to act in its own material interests. All other countries on earth make cold-blooded, real politic con uh, calculations. Worth it, not worth it, good for my people, not good for my people. The idea from the unipolar moment onward has been, well, we're such a great nation that we can do both. But listen, guys, China, we allowed them to rise up in the, in the meantime, not just China. I mean, there's all kinds of global competition that's happening now. We are just like any other country. It's a checks and balance in terms of our sheet. What works and what doesn't? What's good for us? And we to blessings, have been had all this bounty of energy and money and you know all this uh, benefits, so-called, of, of market capitalism. But a lot of that benefit is fading away. We're At the end of the day, we're just like everybody else. And I think we're going to learn all that real soon. And I actually think that yeah. part of the story there is this is a nation that, whether it comes to domestic affairs or foreign affairs or <laughs> anything else, has allowed corporate power to supersede any sort of interest of the American people mm -hmm. or national That's interest. True. And so we're unable to act for the interests of the people. We're unable to act for the interests of the nation because we're so beholden to like whoever's making money off of whatever we're doing in the world. So it really clouds our ability to maneuver in the world. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just wanna give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.